Welcome to A Better HR Business, the podcast that looks at how HR consultants and HR tech firms grow their businesses and how they help their employers to get the best out of their people. Remember, for show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Okay, let's get started. Hello, thanks for joining me. Looking forward to covering a really important topic today, and that's how to solve your biggest HR problems by focusing on one very commonly ignored area. And to do that, I'm very kindly joined by Hans Donkers from Jigsaw Listen. Hans, thank you very much for joining me today. Hi, Ben. Always a pleasure talking to you. Brilliant. Great to have you. And for listeners, where are Bats you based? Based in uh, Belgium, city of Leuven, this city. Magnificent, beautiful part of the world. So let's dive into the the big topic of how to solve your biggest HR problems by focusing on one commonly ignored area. But to start with, can I get your thoughts on what are some of the big HR issues that are facing companies, the chief HR officers, HR directors at the moment? Because there's so much happening. But what are the big picture issues that you see that companies are trying to fix right now? Yeah, well, well, two very common problems and, and well-known problems. Uh, one is um, the burnout pandemic, I would say. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a huge increase in, in long-term absence. And the other one has to do with the great resignation. Um, so very high turnover in every company, which leads to a renewed war for talent. And so keeping people happy, on board that's that's a big challenge for every company while you know the market is being very challenging so every company needs needs talents needs talents to collaborate um to contribute to to the bigger picture but at the same time they're struggling with uh with just getting the people on board and getting them to collaborate yeah absolutely and it's very hard to build a high performing culture when you've got just people walking out the door and then the people who are staying are disgruntled because there are all sorts of side issues that get attached to that, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Another of the big HR issues is diversity and inclusion. How do you see that in some of the work you're doing uh, impacting employers? Mm-hmm. Well, again, there's a parallel with the, the tension between the individual focus and the collective focus. Let's say the... The D of, of DEI on the diversity is very often an individual focus. It's about um, you know uh, gender quota, about ethnicity, etc. And so, I often say the D actually stands for the door. It's about opening the door to minority groups or to people who are underrepresented in the company. But opening the door is one thing. Um, involving people. Uh, accepting them, welcoming them, including them in everything you do. That's another thing. That's the inclusion practice. Mm -hmm. And also there we see that um, people want to feel included in their teams. They don't just want to feel included in the company because the door was already opened by the company. But then the next challenge is, okay, do I have a seat at the table? And if I'm at the table of the team meeting, am I being heard? Can I show up? As my authentic self, uh, am I being valued for what I contribute? And so inclusion, um, to a very large extent, is also a characteristic of team dynamics. Is a team capable of including every single one during the formal meetings, but also in the informal meetings? So again, there, I mean, we should not um, forget that dimension when we talk about diversity and inclusion there's the individual aspect there's the company aspect you know your quota your diversity metrics but what really counts in the end is if people feel that they're welcome and accepted in their teams yeah yeah now i was alluding to the fact that there are many different hr problems we've talked about a couple of the big ones there but the fact that there's a, a commonly ignored area, and for me, it's that whole component of the team mm-hmm. because we're focused so much on individual performance, so individual performance reviews, whether they're annual reviews or daily or yeah. weekly or quarterly pulse surveys and stuff, but it's always at the, the individual level or maybe the mm-hmm. organisational level. Mm-hmm. Um, 
How was that affecting some of those HR problems that we've described? Yeah, yeah, correct. And um, well, so the problems are regarded as often as individual problems. So person X is leaving, Y is person Y is absent, and so a lot of the efforts are on the individual employees or on the whole population of employees. Um, whereas, you know. The place in the organization where people spend their time, but also where they come up with innovative ideas, where they solve these complex problems is in the teams. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there's actually tons of research that shows that a positive team climate has a huge effect uh, and please well-being but also on um, the team performance and so ultimately on the company's performance. And so I would say that the, yeah, the ignored aspect is, is the teamwork, the quality of collaboration. And if um, business leaders or HR leaders focus on teams, it's often um, a focus on the input. Who do we need in a team? Which skills do we need? Which seniority? Uh, how many people? Um, that's the starting point, let's say. And then if we have all the, all the right people in the team, we just hope that the outcomes will be positive. So we focus, there's a lot of focus on the input. And then subsequently, there's a lot of stress on the output. Will yeah. this team perform? Will they meet their um, business objectives? Will people stay on board? Will they stay happy and healthy? Whereas in between, between that starting point and the outcomes, there's a whole dynamic going on. And to me, that's, a, that's a, an often ignored aspect, the focus on that, the quality of collaboration. Um, and you probably heard of, of the, the, uh, the Google's Aristotle project with the support of Amy Edmondson from uh, Harvard Business School. They found actually that the highest performing teams are different, not in the setup, not in the composition, but in how they work together, in what they do and how they do it. Not in, the, not in terms of the people in the team, but in terms of the quality of collaboration. Are people capable of asking help and giving feedback? Do they feel comfortable in addressing difficult issues, etc.? Mm. And so that's actually, it's, it's not only the mediator between the starting point and the outcome, but it's even a predictor of the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, spent some time traveling around uh, Europe and in the US doing some projects where it was a business turnaround project. We were getting all the line managers together and trying to improve processes and things like that. But I remember asking them, can you think back to a time when you were part of a high performing team and how did that feel and what was it? And there were some really interesting discussions about that because we often know what a bad team looks like. I remember when I was a, a university student, I was doing a, a part-time job and a government helpline thing for employment law stuff. And I got told by my colleagues, as soon as it hit 5.15, hey, you need to leave. You're making us look bad. You know, mm -hmm. you can't stay on. Mm -hmm. we've, we've all seen examples like that. But I, yeah. in these discussions where teams are high performing, you know, everyone's sort of pushing each other and saying, you know, you can do better than that. You're not waiting for the boss to come down and say, this is good or this is bad. There's a... Mm -hmm. That's how you push ahead, I imagine. Is that a fair summary? Uh, fully agree on that one. So why do you think uh, organizations don't focus on the team level as much as they do at the individual level? Well, the whole HR process starts with an individual focus, mm. with the hiring of people. Uh, and so um, HR processes... I mean, historically, tend to focus on the individual employee, the individual employee life cycle, and then on the leadership pipeline. But that's always about individuals. And there's this fetish about, you know, high performers. Yeah. Uh, there's fetish on individuals. And um, it's actually an, um, I mean, th think about, you know, the best, the best soccer player. But if they don't know how to communicate with each other, if they don't, you know, trust each other, if they um, are not willing to sacrifice one or sacrifice their ego uh, for the team, then nothing is going to happen. 
It's a, I mean, it's a classic metaphor, but it's, it still holds. And maybe it also has to do with some of the power dynamics in organizations. A lot of attention and budget is spent on senior leaders, on high potentials, you name it. But in the, you know, in the core of the organization, it's all about teams. And there you don't have necessarily, you know, these, these, uh, the chosen few who receive all the attention uh, and the budget. Um, but that's actually where it happens. Yeah. And so there's this dynamic in organizations um, that tends to yeah, focus on those happy few rather than on the whole, yeah, the whole team, the whole army of teams, let's say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how do you think organizations try to solve this problem of uh, improving either workplace culture or improving team performance to affect some of the, the larger HR problems that we talked about at the start? Mm-hmm. What I see from our consulting practice is that um, so oftentimes there's this organization-wide effort, as you said, on culture. So we're going to have this big program be it you know around values where collaboration is one of the key values and uh, through tons of communication efforts town halls posters you name it um, they try to put collaboration on the agenda Um, but that's like mass marketing uh, and that's very much um, about communication and not about actual practices. Um, that, that's one one effort that I see. Uh, it is valuable. I mean, nowadays, almost every company is consciously thinking about the culture they need in order to realize their strategy. But it's a very vague concept, and it mm-hmm. doesn't immediately affect the quality of teamwork. Um, the other um, common effort is um, sending all managers and leaders to trainings. Yeah, that's a good um, one. <laughs> and, you know, there they do talk about psychological safety, about um, leading teams, um, etc. But it's taking out these people from their context and in that classroom or in the workshop room Um, their minds will be triggered, um, but the transfer Mm -hmm. from that classroom to the daily team practice is extremely difficult. And you're actually betting on one single member of the team. And you invest in this person to grow, to develop, but you forget about the system because uh, my, my conviction is that a team can also learn. We should regard a team as, as an entity as well. Uh, there is a possibility of team learning. Uh, a team can develop new habits. A team can evolve in terms of shared beliefs, yeah. shared assumptions. And so if you invest in team learning rather than in individual learning, the, the effect will be X times uh, more powerful. Yeah. And I, I suppose there are a couple of others, such as the classic is just the CEO or whomever tells the HR team, go fix it. We've got these problems of high staff turnover and um, uh, these sorts of issues, uh, burnout, et cetera, C- go fix it. And so that, yeah, as you say, they might send them off to, to leadership training and things like that, or I suspect probably bring in a bunch of consultants or yep. invest in wellbeing yep. apps and things like that. Oh, yeah, often we, we focus on the negative outcomes. And then I mean, if we talk about absence, uh, there's tons of money and time invested in resilience workshops, in um, you know, um, yoga sessions on the yeah. work floor, etc. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's very uh, individually focused. And that's um, trying to tackle the individual uh, aspect um, and not the not the context because one could say that it's um it's the context that um, makes the individual sick um, yeah. especially if we're talking about you know psychological well-being yeah 
Um, yeah, this area, it reminds me of this whole story or it was a, a psychological or scientific experiment and it's highly unethical, but um, I don't know, back in the 50s or 60s where there were, I think was, there were animals, monkeys in a, in a, in a laboratory or something where they were, there were bananas at the top of a pole or a top of a mm-hmm. pretend tree or something like that. And originally the monkeys would climb up, grab a banana when they're hungry, come back down and eat it. But then after a while, what the, um, the experiment leaders were doing was when a monkey would climb up to grab the banana, they would shoot it with water or mm-hmm. give it a, a fright or something, which is yeah. of course terrible. But over time, the group learned you don't climb that tree because it, something's going to happen and it's going to be nasty and it's going to be bad for all of us. So eventually, mm-hmm. you know, they all learned not to do it. Then they would introduce a new monkey into the group. And the new monkey would see a bunch of beautiful bananas yeah. climb up and it would be pulled back by its, uh, its other, the other monkeys in the group. Yeah. And so the group learned together. And so when we're talking about some of the different solutions to fixing this, these issues that we're discussing, I suppose they're probably more around individual focused areas, such as you know, the yoga stuff or mm-hmm. the consulting firms and things, but it's always around trying to find different ways to, uh, change individuals. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm curious, what does Jigsaw Listen do or how is it different in its focus on the teams aspect? Uh, so firstly, how are you different? And then secondly, what exactly does Jigsaw Listen do? Okay, well, to start with, uh, with the latter, we use both um, data science and um, empirical evidence on team performance to give teams the right triggers to uh, to know what they have to learn and how they can learn, how they can develop new shared habits. And that also answers maybe your first question. Um, Jigsaw is a joint venture between a machine learning agency, a bunch of mathematicians and data scientists uh, on the one hand, and a boutique consultancy firm on the other hand. So we combine data science with um, very solid experience and knowledge about how teams function, how they dysfunction, and what one can do to change that. And so in our team learning platform, we use uh, validated surveys on different aspects of team dynamics, such as team cohesion, uh, psychological safety, inclusion, team effectiveness, So we use those validated surveys and then we use machine learning to actually generate tailored recommendations to teams um, as to what they should do, what they can do. Um, And with, with those two elements, we bring them in this learning cycle of assessing the situation, understanding what's needed, moving to action and keep that cycle going on. So the next time, uh, they they take a, a survey or they receive recommendations, it will take into account their history. So instead of having these, let's say, uh, flash-in-the-pan surveys, where there's a, where there's a lot of things, focus, yeah, yeah. the one-off things, without any follow-up or follow-through, yeah. we want to bring those teams into yeah, a learning mode and a learning cycle. So as the teams answer the surveys, the data changes or evolves? Is that right? Well, um, hopefully their results will change. Huh? Yeah. Because if we, if we give the right recommendations, they will, it will change. But we also take into account what they have done in the past, what has worked. So both on the team level, uh, we can take their history of actions into account and monitor the evolution, but also on a more meta level, we can compare many different teams over many organizations and improve what we call then the recommendation engine. It's like, consider it like your, your, your Spotify account, your Netflix mm-hmm. account, based on your behavior. Uh, you will get other recommendations. And so based on what a team does, but also based on what we discover in the data on which actions work best in which context, the recommendation will will improve over time. And so you could say it's like a, a very experienced consultant who has worked for many different teams in many different industries, many different companies, and 
in her or his head, there is this calculation going on, this assessment, okay, what do I see? How do I compare this to other teams that I've seen before? What has worked in the past? What hasn't? And based on that diagnosis, an experienced consultant will guide the team towards um, their next steps, their, um, their learning challenges. Um, and how long does that take? For a, for a consultant? Or for the and for the cheeks I listen. Ah, well, th- 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 that's the good thing. It's it's instant. I mean, as soon as you as as a, as a sufficient number of people have filled out the survey, and we know some stuff about the context, they will get instant recommendations. But obviously, I mean, if we talk about and, and let's zoom out a bit here. If we talk about the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence in 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 an HR context. When you're dealing with people, I always say the last mile of the decision making should be human. Mm. But the, let's say the, um, the augmented intelligence before could or should be based on data. So eventually, in the end, it's the team members in the driving seat uh, discussing the results and the recommendations and ultimately accepting or rejecting it, uh, ultimately deciding what to do. Wow, but they don't cool. have to start from scratch. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I, the reason I'm laughing is because I'm thinking back to, I've run lots of employee surveys in my life and pretty much every single time, what happens is you do the survey, you get the data in and then you stick up some slides to the management team. And then you, let's say it's a management team of 10 people in the room. Mm-hmm. You'll have at least two people and they're always the underperforming managers or the ones that mm-hmm. are causing the problems. Those two people will every single time say, no, that was Joe in Department X. He was upset that the photocopier broke down. That's yeah. why there's a bad score in that yeah. area. Yeah. And then you have a half an hour discussion about the validity and blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But I love the thing that you said there about, well, these decisions, yes, we've got to get to the last mile should be human. But up until that point, things should be da- based on data and empirical evidence. And yeah. the fact that it's then instant, that's, that's amazing. That's so different to the experience I've had. Uh, in sort of trying to solve these HR problems through the surveying model. Yeah, yeah. Because um, usually you just get, you know, the the visualization of what was put in. And yeah. You get a visualization yeah. of, of the different results. Um, often already, you know, um, treated um, or filtered mm-hmm. uh, by the person who's presenting it. <laughs> um our platform shows the results in the most transparent way to every team member. Yeah. Um, and we have very detailed scripts and recommendations on how teams can, can have a good dialogue around it, on how to involve every single voice uh, in that dialogue and to come to a shared understanding and then in the next step to a, a shared commitment on, on what to do. Got it. I'm getting it carried away because you've just raised two two other areas, two amazing things. Um, is the fact that it it comes up with instant solutions, so mm-hmm. uh, that cuts out that whole delay that the management team, where they're doing the debating and stuff like yeah. that, which is the the bit that I always found slowed everything down. So you'd have mm-hmm. a workforce who've given employee feedback and then they hear nothing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's a long, slow process. Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. we'll we'll fix True. that. We'll do whole more meetings. We'll do this. Mm-hmm. We'll add a new mm-hmm. app or whatever. Slows it all down. But the other bit that you never hear about, which I think is is covered off in this, is the fact that not everything in a workplace cultural change project or whatever should be driven by the senior management. Like this mm-hmm. is saying back to the team, it's up to you. you. You guys are in your team every day. You know, the CEO isn't sitting there next to you all day long. Uh-huh. How is your team going to improve? And, and it's giving instant improvement ideas and data for them to. I think that's brilliant because they it gives the ownership back, right? It gives ownership, but it also you know gives them a direction because most managers are more than willing to to work on the team dynamics. They're more than willing yeah. to try to improve the quality of collaboration or the engagement of their people. But oftentimes they just don't know how because it's not in their expertise. And so my experience in, in, with, with operational team leaders or, or, or even business leaders is that you don't have to convince them about um, the importance of 
team dynamics of collaboration, but they just often don't know what to do. And they're very grateful if they get concrete, pragmatic, actionable recommendations. Because I want to stress that as well. Um, Oftentimes, the internal learning and development consultant or HR um, business partner will come with with great ideas, but ideas that take a lot of time are difficult to implement into the daily team practices. Whereas our recommendations are exactly that. They are, they can be applied as of tomorrow and they don't require, you know, um, a two day offsite or a whole change of um, the modus operandi of the team. So it's 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 like you know the the rituals and the practices in agile. Mm-hmm. You should be capable of applying them, implementing them in your daily operations. Yeah, and it shouldn't require any additional effort on top of that. The 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 mechanisms already in place. Absolutely, and it makes it easier and. It- and helps it embed it better, but also it's the fact that it is that daily, just almost part of your na- normal daily life at, at work, as opposed to the every three, six months, let's do a big HR change management project event. That is cool. It gets you a big buzz and excitement for a bit, and then it drops away and everyone forgets until we do the next thing. Whereas this yeah, is day in, yeah. day out. Think about your personal life, Ben. If you and your partner at a certain stage think hey we're um we're living next to each other we should you know have more quality time to you go on a you know a wild long trip to the south of africa in the summer and think wow that's gonna improve yeah. things um <clears throat> but again that's a that's a one-off event and a month later you will observe yourself you know repeating the same old patterns Whereas if you succeed in installing regular habits, let's take every Thursday evening uh, a couple of hours together with a glass of wine or just go for a walk and see what happens. And that walk, that glass of wine doesn't have to be spectacular. Uh, But if you do it on a regular base, then you create this opportunity for a good chat and for a good connection. And similarly with team dynamics, what a lot of companies do is say, okay, you can go on a team event or, or, or a team building once a year. Here's a budget. And <clears throat> if you're high in the organization, maybe you have the budget for two or three days. If you're an operational team, you will get a budget for like a dinner once a year. But that's not going to change things. Because those are one-off events. It's like the trip with your partner in the summer. And then during the year, you... It's like a sugar rush. It's it's, it's a sugar rush indeed. Yeah. yeah. So turning to the Jigsaw Listen, the platform itself, wonderful, ever evolving data, which people Mm -hmm. can use day in, day out. The, the, the feedback or the learning prompts, or can you tell us about those? What, what happens next when they get that data back? What, what's that next step thing that you've been describing? So before moving to actions, Obviously, we want teams to have a good dialogue first, to understand uh, the results, to do some collective sense-making around it. Hey, uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, Not to, like you said before, to find excuses like, yeah, yeah, but that was because that project, you know, was was taking all of our efforts. No, no. You want to guide them through an understanding of, hey, where where can we improve? Uh, Where is our team dynamics going wrong today? And so our recommendation engine highlights a number of those challenges, those areas for improvement, and then um, very concretely describes actionable stuff that teams can do. So if there's um, a problem with giving and asking feedback, then teams will receive a recommendation on an um, on an uh, actionable uh, practice that they can implement within their team sessions uh, with a detailed script on, hey, how can you make it more comfortable and safe to 
give and ask feedback or um, what can you do? Here's a format. Here's um, an interaction script, as we call it, on um, uh, discussing mistakes, openly sharing and discussing mistakes in your team meeting, like failure rounds every every week, every month in the planned team meeting. Nice. So we actually nudge them towards a topic, um, towards a certain way of interacting that makes it predictable and safe for people. It's like in your, I mean, if in Agile, your daily standup allows you to very proactively um, raise issues, raise problems. Yeah. And if you don't do that on a daily basis, if you're in a, if you're in a, in a team with software developers and you just wait, uh, a month, then a lot of things going, can go wrong. And so similarly, with, that, with Team Dynamics, you need these regular habits to be installed. Yeah, that makes sense. So when you're explaining Jigsaw Listen to people, to employers who have these big HR challenges that it can help them solve by addressing the, the commonly ignored area, which is the team component of the organization, mm-hmm. I'm guessing you probably get some questions about it and things like that, such as, you know, the, the old chestnut of our business is different. I've heard this in my consulting life, the, you know, the world mm-hmm. over. Our business is different. You know, your process won't work here or they've already tried employee surveys mm-hmm. or um, or other things like that. What do you answer to sort of those ones about our, our business is, is different and then also the surveying question? Yeah. Your business might be different, but, I mean, people are people. And regardless of the type of business you're in, it will always be about people um, feeling comfortable to share things, feeling accepted for who they are. um, And um, then being capable of giving the best version of themselves to the team. And I mean, it doesn't, that's, that's regardless of your, of the business you're in. Mm. What we do take into account also in the recommendations is your practical context. Not every team operates in the same way in in a production environment. uh, Even yesterday uh, we had a a large um, leadership meeting uh, with a, a big player in the pharmaceutical industry and the business leader of the logistics department was sharing with his colleagues um, his experiences with Jigsaw Listen. And his context is very uh, peculiar in the sense that I mean, in, the, in the research departments, you have people collaborating um, around the table, um, planning their new uh, clinical trials. Whereas in the logistics department, it's a very operational blue collar environment and people don't sit around the meeting table all day. So, I mean, that context will also determine the type of recommendations people get. So yeah, your business is different, but people issues are the same. It's all about, you know, um, feeling included, uh, feeling part of the team, um, being comfortable with speaking up, with sharing ideas. But the context might ask for some some different actions. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so another question is around um, the tech integration. Is it a long, slow process of, of several months to get it onboarded and connected to the, you know, the lists of employees and teams? Uh, how, how does it work? No, no, no. We, we've developed this as a as, as a SaaS solution. Okay. Um, and I mean, if you can you can start tomorrow. Oh, really? um, it, it operates independently from your HCM or HRIS or LMS. Um, you can start with it instantly, um, so there's no connection needed. However. Uh, connection is possible. We can tap into your LMS system and uh, maybe even use your library of trainings and uh, scripts to plug into our library. Uh, So we have a number of customers who say, you know, we have these homegrown uh, methodologies um, for team interaction and we want you to use them. Or uh, another uh, customer... um, 
30,000 employees worldwide in a large cultural transformation. Um, they have a number of practices and uh, team rituals that they want to push to their teams. Uh, this is not our methodology, but we can map them to our different dimensions and include it in the, in the recommendations. So it is possible. Got it. Oh, very good. Very fast. And then the final sort of common question I hear is around the uh, issue of that we have such a long list of uh, HR issues and priorities. Why should we prioritize improving our teams and working on this area? I mean, there's tons of, of research available that shows that if you, um, if people feel included, if your team cohesion is high, if the psychological safety in your team is high, then you will see it in the business outcomes and in the people outcomes. So the business case is clear. And if you don't, um, if you don't invest in that, I mean, your risk for, for absence and turnover will, will increase significantly. So if you really want to, um, to have an effect of your efforts, you better, um, you better work on that because that's where uh, the difference is being made. And also at the anecdotal level, I'm sure anyone listening to this can think, well, they've been in lots of different teams in their career and think to the ones where the team was amazing and then the other teams where it was not so good. Yeah. And I'm sure that they have been pushed up to the higher level or dragged yeah. down to the lower level. Exactly. And that, it's good that you mentioned because that really proves the point. I mean, you are the same individual, but yeah. you've experienced different team dynamics. Although you are that individual, and even as a team leader, you can um, get a new team to lead. And I mean, you're the same person with the same leadership qualities, but the team dynamics can differ very significantly. Yeah. And so we should, I mean, and I've said it before, we should move our focus from the individual skills and talents to um, the team as a unit of thinking and as a, um, as a blocker or an accelerator for performance. Yeah. Some, something a little bit different, but I know that Jigsaw Listen has some really interesting resources for employers, particularly, uh, for example, around failure reviews uh, and inclusion processes. Can you describe a couple of those and then how people might be able to get them? Yeah, sure. I mean, as a result of our um, of our work with tons of customers uh, in the uh, in the boutique consultancy firm, which is called Bean Machine, um, we've developed a whole library of very practical, actionable scripts or templates uh, that require no additional consulting. That a team leader, a team can just download from our website or. Um, consult in the uh, in the Jigsaw Listen platform and start working on very concrete topics immediately. It's um, we call it um, interaction scripts, and basically it's it's like a very detailed how to guide to um, allow a conversation on a difficult topic like failures, or to um, enable teams to look together to their um, inclusion practices or the absence of inclusion practices, uh, not on a philosophical or high level way, but really allowing them to look at their actual reality, their day in, day out uh, habits, um, et cetera. So, uh, and, and we, we've learned that, that team leaders love it. Uh, they, they, they are not waiting for another conceptual model. They are not waiting for another inspirational keynote of an hour. What they need is an actionable uh, guide that tells them, hey, if you want to achieve this, take these steps and you will, you know, you, you will get there. Got it. Uh, now, before I let you go, I just wanted to clarify, you've, you've mentioned that that there was recently a meeting with a large pharmaceutical company, but for, for listeners, what are the kinds of employer types that you help? Who do you help? We help any company where um, teamwork and collaboration makes the difference. And so obviously there's a certain size, minimal size, let's say, and we're talking about at least two, 300 people because that already creates some complexity 
and um, creates a need for collaboration. Um, typically, it's also about um, knowledge workers needing to share ideas, reflect together, uh, sit together, um, and, and, and find ways to, to, to solve complex issues. Um, but basically, I mean, regardless of industry, regardless of location, we, um, we serve from, you know, uh, logistics company to pharmaceuticals to, to banking, insurance, uh, professional services, you name it. Any organization that struggles with collaboration, um, yeah, they're, um, we, we're, we're more than happy to help them. Excellent. And I've seen some of the feedback and uh, reviews and things of, of the, what you guys have achieved in, in uh, companies. So that's, that's amazing. I'm curious, uh, you're so heavily involved in helping employers improve their workplace cultures and things like that and have, have had such success. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on what's coming down the line in terms of changes to HR and the world of work? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, all the talk about these big changes and the disruptions sometimes makes me a bit feel uncomfortable because the end of the day it's still all about people mm. and the psychology of people hasn't changed and will not change that uh, that quickly so rather than looking for the next big thing or the next big trend you need to be ready for i would say let's focus on the essence of things and regardless of all the geopolitical changes or technical technological technological changes that are coming towards us, I'd say we still need to understand how people function. Uh, we need to have some good understanding of human psychology, of social psychology, and based on that, create the right environments, get the best out of people and make them thrive. Yeah. And that's no different today than it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Very good. For people listening to this, if they want to learn more about Jigsaw, listen, what should they do next? They should uh, come and have a coffee with me. Yeah. Or, or just uh, go to our website, which is uh, www.jigsaw, that's J-I-G-S-O dot com. Uh, and there they can download tons of uh, inspirational stuff um, or schedule that coffee with me or one of my colleagues. Brilliant. Excellent. So yeah, highly recommend it. And like I said at the start, I think it's an excellent way to address some of those big ticket HR issues that will continue to annoy and uh, distract or affect companies uh, and may not get solved unless you look at this core issue of the team layer of the organization. So I think I just love what you're doing. So yeah, well done. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today on A Better HR Business, the podcast that explores the world of HR consulting and HR tech businesses. For show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Remember to subscribe and share the show with any friends who are busy growing a HR business. Thanks and see you next time.